This video is about inverse functions. This is AP Precalculus Topic 2.8. If you appreciate this content, please give it a like. If f and g are inverses, then several things are true. Number one, g of x equals f inverse. Number two, if a point xy is a point on the graph of f, then the point yx is a point on the graph of g. Number three, with inverse functions, all of the x and y values are switched. So the graphical behaviors in terms of x and y will also be switched. For example, the domain of f is the range of f inverse. Number four, a continuous function will only have an inverse function if it is strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. If a function changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa, it will not pass the horizontal line test and its inverse relation will not pass the vertical line test as a result. Example one, let f be a continuous function with selected values in the table below. Let g be the inverse of f such that g of x equals f inverse of x. Find the following values if possible. Part a, for this notation we work from the inside out. So we begin with f at zero. f at zero is one. Moving outward, we get to the second f. Now we evaluate f at one. f at one is negative one. So that's the answer to part a. For part b, we need to evaluate g at negative three. We don't have a table for g, we only have a table for f. But f and g are inverses. So we can use the definition of inverses to find the value of g at negative three indirectly. g at negative three is equal to some constant, let's call it c. If g and f are inverses, then if we sort of switch the x and y, we get a valid point. So f at c must equal negative three. Now we can look back at the table. f at what is equal to negative three? Well, f at four is negative three. That means g at negative three must equal four. For the rest of the problems, I'm going to show this logic in a thought bubble. So for part c, we need to find g at six. By the properties of inverses, g at six will equal c, if and only if f at c is equal to six. So f at what is equal to six? That's negative three. Part d, for this notation we work from the inside out. So first I need to find the value of g at negative one. But g at negative one will equal c, if and only if f at c is equal to negative one. So f at what? is negative one, that's one. Moving to the outer function, we need to evaluate g at one. g at one will equal c, if and only if f at c is equal to one. So f at what is equal to one, that's zero. That's the answer to part d. Part e. For this open circle notation, we work from right to left. So first, we need to find f at negative two. f at negative two is three. Moving to the left, we now need to evaluate f inverse at three. My thought bubble says f inverse at three will equal c, if and only if f at c equals three. So f at what is equal to three? That's negative two. That's the answer. For part f, we just need to find f inverse at negative three. When evaluating the inverse of f, you ask yourself f at what is equal to that number. f at what is equal to negative three? That's four. Example two. The function k is defined over the interval from negative four to 11. As shown above, let k inverse represent the inverse of k. Part a, 
What is the minimum value of k of x? What is the minimum value of k inverse? The domain of k of x is from negative 4 to 11. The range of k of x goes from negative 3 to 6. We're talking y values now. That answers the first question. k of x has a minimum value of negative 3, the lower end of the range. For inverse functions, the x's and y's are all switched. So the domain and the range will switch places. Now we can see that the minimum value of k inverse will be negative 4, the lower limit of the range. Part b, first we need to find k inverse at 6. But the way inverses work, we know that k inverse at 6 will equal question mark only if k at question mark is equal to 6. So to evaluate the inverse, you ask yourself k at what will equal 6? Well, 6 is up here, so k at 11 is equal to 6. So the answer is 11. Next, we must evaluate k inverse at 4. Just ask yourself k at what is equal to 4. Here's the output value of 4. We see that k at 6 is 4. So the answer is 6. Example 3. The function f is defined over the interval from negative 2 to 8 as shown above. Let f inverse represent the inverse of f. Part A. What is the maximum value of f inverse? We see that the domain of f goes from negative 2 to 8, and the range of f goes from negative 3 to 7. Therefore, the domain of f inverse will go from negative 3 to 7, and the range of f inverse will go from negative 2 to 8. They switch. So f inverse has a maximum value of 8, the upper limit of the range. Part B, find f inverse at 3. To evaluate f inverse at 3, ask yourself f at what is equal to 3. The output value of 3 is right here. So we can see that f at 2 is equal to 3. So that's the answer. Next, we need to evaluate f inverse at 1. To do this, we ask ourselves f at what is equal to 1. Here's the output value of 1, and we see that f at 3 is equal to 1. So that's the answer. Part C, what is the domain of f inverse? Well, it looks like we answered that right at the top. The domain of f inverse is the closed interval from negative 3 to 7, which can be written as an inequality or using interval notation. Example 4. The function g is defined over the interval from negative 3 to 10. As shown above, let g inverse represent the inverse of g. Values of the increasing function f are given in the table above for selected values of x. Find the following if possible. Part a. Working from the inside out, we first must evaluate h at 6. h at 6 is 10. Moving outward, we now evaluate g at 10. g at 10 is negative 1. So that's the answer for part A. Part B, working from the inside out, we begin with h at 0. h at 0 is 3. Next, we move on to evaluating g inverse at 3. But we don't have g inverse. So we think indirectly and ask ourselves g at what is equal to 3. Here's the output value of 3, and we see that g at 4 is equal to 3. So 4 is the answer. Part C, working from the inside out, we begin with g at 8. g at 8 is 0. 
Moving to the outside, we must now evaluate h inverse at zero. But we don't have h inverse. So we must ask ourselves h at what is equal to zero. h at negative one is equal to zero. So that's the answer. Part D, working from the inside out, we begin with g inverse at negative one. Since we don't have g inverse, we ask ourselves g at what is equal to negative one. Well, here is the output value of negative one. We can see that g at 10 is negative one. Now we move on to the outer function, so we must evaluate h inverse at 10. We do not have h inverse, so we ask ourselves h at what is equal to 10. We see that h at 6 is equal to 10, so that's the answer. Hey guys, don't forget to like and subscribe, but also if you found this video helpful, there's a lot more where that came from. You can click the upper link which will take you to the whole unit playlist, or you can click the lower link, which will take you to the next video in the playlist. See you there.